JPS? No, nobody raised their hand. We have David Endicott, the head of Alcon. Nobody raised their hand. So if you got a vacant seat at your table, that was them. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, some snippets about some people uh, today uh, in our uh, history. One thing you'll notice, if you're alive, I probably won't mention you. <laughs> there may be one or two mentioned at the end uh, that are uh, still with us, and thank goodness for that. Uh, I'll start with my mentor, who was uh, Charles Tandy. Charles was a larger-than-life character. When Charles was in the room, he had a magnetic personality. There'd be a crowd around him. If it was business people, there'd be a crowd around him. If it were social people in Fort Worth. He was a great teacher. He gave me the same exact, same lecture on gross margin 20 times. <laughs> I'm talking about this is a 20 minute lecture. This isn't a quick one. He understood finance. He did uh, stock buybacks uh, before Wall Street thought it was a good idea. In fact, he got criticized for it. He loved convertible notes. Charles knew his numbers. Plus, the P&L was his Bible. As a relatively new data processing manager, I got to tell him that we were going to convert the P&Ls from manual to the computer. And I was selling hard and uh, Charles finally stopped me and said, and, and one of the things I uh, told him is that we get the P&Ls out three days sooner on the computer than with all the uh, manual uh, uh, calculations. And so he finally stopped me and he said, the store in Bakersfield, California, has been losing money for three months. And if you got the P&Ls out three days sooner, I'd know for three months and three days that the store was losing money. It doesn't make a damn when you get the numbers out. It's what you do with them when you do get them out. And that was... Uh, just a simple uh, way that Charles addressed lots of subjects. Charles collected people, companies, like uh, some people collect books. In the 1970s annual report, there were 22 companies in the Tandy umbrella, including Radio Shack, Tandy Leather, Color Tile, Leonard's, at L, at L, at L. Now, for those of you that weren't around in those days, Leonard's department store at its peak would make a Walmart Supercenter look like a convenience store. <laughs> it covered about five blocks in the northwest part of downtown Fort Worth. One of Charles' financial moves that ultimately made it possible for me to be CEO of Tandy Car came from the spin-off of two groups of the, all of these companies I talked about. One of the spin-offs was named Tandy Crafts, and it was all of the retail businesses except Radio Shack. And one was Tandy Brands, and it was all the leather manufacturing business, leaving Tandy Corp to only be an electronics-related business. Charles Love Fort Worth, <coughs> and TCU. He moved operations from West 7th Street, where he had easy parking, to downtown. He built Tandy Center on Leonard property when downtown was pretty dead. 
CDT died unexpectedly in 1978 at age 60. I'll go to John Justin. He built his own type of conglomerate. Justin Boots, Nicola Boots, Tony Lama Boots, Acme Brick, Ceramic Cooling Tower, et al, et al. As a businessman, he was elected mayor from 1961 to 63, a TCU graduate, he delivered for the TCU drugstore on his bicycle. He faced the neighborhood challenge to let TCU get the old Worth Hills golf course. In other words, he was the mayor when Worth Hills golf course went to TCU. And of course, we know he was the chair of the rodeo. Another mayor, Baird Friedman, from 63 to 65, was a lawyer and banker and knew everybody in town because he had lunch with someone most days. He was one of the Fort Worth founders of the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. And he taught me to count my fingers every time I shook hands with anyone from Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell a number of stories about times when I didn't get my fingers out. <laughs> and of course, I talked to Baird about when we were thinking about founding this organization, and unfortunately, he. Uh, died about that time in 1998. Willard Barr was the next mayor, also in the printing business. The next mayor I want to talk about is Bob Bowen, a very successful small businessman. To emphasize public-private cooperation, Bob called me one day and said, be at the Texas Hotel, call it something else now, uh, this afternoon and we'll have some other people there. Clark Johnson, who was the CEO of Pier 1, Bob Crandall, who was the CEO of American Airlines, and a few other people were there. Bob needed several hundred thousand dollars the next day to secure getting the currency plant uh, that we have on the north side. I pledged $50,000 from Tandy and other companies chipped in. Bob led the city's collaboration uh, after that. He led the city's collaboration with the paroles over lines. It wasn't all easy. I sat in with Bob in a couple of meetings to help keep him from getting beat up by the parole. <laughs> <laughs> Dee and I arranged for Bob Bowen to get to be the assistant to the chancellor at TCU which permitted Bob to continue his community service, always wanting to make Fort Worth a better place. Of course, Perry Bass was a congenial community leader and philanthropist. He also had four or five boys. Together, they did a lot for Fort Worth to serve the community he loved. The most politically important man in the city, probably in the state, clearly influential nationally, was Dean Kelly. Laura has it, he changed signs in his yard overnight if someone he backed lost a race. <laughs> John, John, that's not Laura. <laughs> uh, he might call the winner of a race the next morning that he had not supported and asked how much it cost to get on board. <laughs> he was frequently willing to tell someone exactly what he thought. Uh, for example, in 1988, during the Republican convention, he had a small dinner in the room across the way here for Democratic vice presidential nominee, Lloyd Benson. After dinner, Dee stood up and said, Senator Benson, everybody in this room except Jim Wright is going to vote against you unless you can change their minds. Lloyd didn't try. 
uh, D uh, fought Southwest Airlines from the day they started in Love Field, and uh, it was not until uh, Congress stepped in after a last second agreement by the entities to phase out the right amendment, freeze the number of gates, and prohibit international flights. He was a great trustee and supporter of TCU. The D.J. Kelly Alumni Center was a gift from his friends uh, who's who client list uh, before, long before his demise. Speaking of Jim Wright, a real love-hate individual, love of position, hate of ideology. Eddie <laughs> Childs had bumper stickers and radio ads against Jim that said, I'm mad too, Eddie. <laughs> and uh, the group that was on that mad side included Baird Friedman and Rice Tilly. Support from Eamon Carter, and my deal just collapsed. Uh, okay, for Eamon Carter and D. Kelly, and even myself, because uh, Jim could help. He was famous for helping anyone no matter how small or large the problem. Now I'll kind of talk about, in another area, about the origin of the computer. The semiconductor computer chip was invented by TI and Intel in the early 70s and became available as a minimal product in the mid-70s. It's hard to imagine, but at that time, there were no computer press, no computer magazine, very little uh, interest in the community anywhere in computers. And the only thing around were the large IBM mainframes and the digital equipment, mini computer. We canvassed the industry and no one was interested in making a computer for Radio Shack. I had a small engineering group and I asked them to develop one. The leader of that group and I went to Silicon Valley one day and looking for parts for CB radios. And we uh, asked National Semiconductor what they were doing in the microprocessor area. They brought in an engineer that mentioned there was a computer store in Silicon Valley. We went there that evening, no computers, some printed circuit boards, some semiconductors, some keyboards, some power supplies, and other miscellaneous electronics scattered around on some tables. And the engineer we met earlier was there also. When we left, I told my guys to hire him. We did. We went to RCA and we found an old gray, black and white TV we converted into a monitor. Within a few months, we had a gray keyboard on a table with an engineering sample prototype underneath. We showed the computer to Charles Tandy and Louis Kornfeld. Charles blew a little smoke and said, Build a thousand, if we can't sell them, we'll use them for something in the store. <laughs> this was in January and by August 3, 1977, we had designed, tooled, and developed, including the basic software for a microcomputer system, a fully wired, which didn't exist in the market at that time. We introduced it in New York City at the Warwick Hotel. A few retail analysts showed up, but there was no such thing as a microcomputer analyst, and some general press showed up, but they were more interested in some kind of Puerto Rican demo down on the street. We <laughs> came back from New York, and all hell broke loose. <clears throat> Questions from stores and customers, Orders, 
customer service support. <clears throat> Initially, Luann tried to get everyone supported. We were finally able to ship some machines in September and ship 5,000 that year. That was all we could assemble. Our competitors shipped none. In the spring of 1978, we decided we needed a better enhanced version of BASIC for our computer. On a mimeograph, if you know what that is, on a mimeograph newsletter, we learned Bill Gates had written a good BASIC in Albuquerque for a computer kit. This was on a Saturday. So I said, I wanted Bill in my office the next Saturday. He came on Wednesday. Bill brought a one-page contract detailing the delivery. Now, a Microsoft contract today looks about like a telephone book. <laughs> but he brought a, a page and a half, and we thoroughly reviewed it and discussed it. And when we came to the price, now you got to remember Gates is about 19 at this point. I said, horse shit. <laughs> but he got the job. When he told the story afterward, he had gone from Albuquerque to Seattle because his sister was getting married that week and he wanted to be there for all the uh, functions. And he and his father wrote the contract and did role playing to be to perfect Bill's answers. And Bill said, and my father didn't tell me what to say when he said horseshit. <laughs> <laughs> Bill was a good technologist, but the real genius of Bill Gates was licensing his product. Uh, by, he didn't sell anything for many years. Now they sell uh, that PlayStation thing, whatever they call it, and what have you. But he basically just licensed software and so collected the license from IBM and everybody else known to man. And that's what made him so wealthy. Now in 1978, most people didn't know what a microcomputer was. As a result, we brainstormed, barnstormed. Every week we'd go to a different town and take a hotel ballroom, set up 20 computers, invite the local stockbrokers in at 4 p.m. and the general public in from 6 to 9 and demonstrate uh, computer, and that's where a lot of people saw a computer for the first time, because we had large crowds in many of those locations. We uh, collaborated with Microsoft on the first laptop computer, the Tandy 100, and Windows was introduced on the Tandy 2000. Now at that time, Windows wasn't any good, and the Tandy 2000 wasn't either. <laughs> I retired as CEO of Tandy on December 31, 1998, at age 60. Tandy had died at 60, my father at 59, and I had pretty much been in a pressure cooker since Charles died in 1978. I was a Justin Industries board member. John Justin was 80 and in declining health, and the board asked me to become chairman to help solidify the long-term value of the company. The next summer, I was in my second home in Florida, and the phone rang. <coughs> I answered the phone, and what comes back to me? This is Warren. I understand you're interested in selling Justin. Still didn't know who in the world I was talking about. <laughs> I finally guessed it must be Warren Buffett. I asked how he wanted to proceed. He wanted to send a team uh, to do due diligence. He said he didn't have anybody to send because Berkshire Hathaway's corporate staff 
was only 12 and a half people. If anybody comes, it will have to be me. He said he would come in a couple of weeks. I called him back and asked if he wanted to see plants when he came, if he wanted to see numbers, if he wanted to see products, what did he want? None of those. I want to see the people that will report to me and learn about their market shares. Well, when Warren came, he first listened to John Justin tell a hundred year history of the company. And then the boot company showed their 35% share of the Western boot business. And then the real value of Justin, Acme Brick, described theirs over 70% share of the brick business in the seven state area. Seven state area where people really build the bricks. On the way back to the airport, Warren said, here's what I'll give you for the company. And I said, give me a dollar more and you can have it right now. He said, it's not worth it. <laughs> We had a regularly scheduled board meeting a couple of weeks after that, and it was going to be on a Wednesday. So on Monday of that week, at noon, I sent a fax to two groups that had been doing due diligence for a month, and to Warren, and asked them to have their price in by noon on Wednesday. At 3 o'clock Monday, two hours, three hours after I sent it out, my fax starts up and it's a letter from Warren for the same price he had offered before. He couldn't come to our meeting, he said, but he'd like to send his lawyer. Yes, one of the other parties got an offer in with several contingencies and the other could not get their offer ready. Warren's lawyer assured no contingencies and pulled out of his bag a contract. And he said, here's a contract used on a similar deal and handed it to D. Kelly. Now, D. was John's close friend and attorney. To everyone's surprise, about an hour later, D. declares, this is a good contract with no gotchas. Now, can you believe that from a lawyer? <laughs> Warren wanted to close on Friday. I couldn't imagine that and I delayed the closing until Monday and of course after we announced we had to get Hart Scott Rodino federal approval for the transaction and I've been through a number of those over the years and they usually took about a month. Warren said we can get that done this week. Uh, my recollection is our shareholders had their money within 30 days. Moving on, the phone rings one day and it was D. He said, Paul Andrews uh, might be interested in selling TTI to Warren Buffett. And Paul had talked to some investment bankers and didn't like their approach. He had developed a huge book. I mean, it was really thick. And uh, it was Friday. And Friday afternoon, I called Warren. He said, overnight the book for Saturday morning delivery. He calls at around 3 p.m. on Sunday and said he couldn't pay what he thought Paul would want. I did possibly the most irreverent thing I've ever done. I called Warren on Thursday and said, Warren, you're making a mistake. Let us make a presentation and come see you. He said yes. We made a new book focused on the things that Warren was most interested in. And then we called Warren on a Monday afternoon and said we uh, had our presentation ready. What did Warren say? I overnight the book for 10 a.m. delivery and be here Wednesday morning. Well, I was fairly nervous. Uh, about uh, all of this. I kept telling him Warren was the easiest person in the world to talk to. We arrived about 10 on Wednesday morning and there was talk about baseball. Warren's a big baseball fan. 
uh, about Sammy Ball because uh, Warren had seen Sammy Ball playing for the Washington Redskins and people from Omaha that had uh, places in the same area Paul did in a lot. All of a sudden Warren says, here's what I'll do and explains the deal and then said, don't tell Charlie Munger because he, he doesn't like this type of deal structure. Uh, then Warren said, let's go have a hamburger. All small talk at lunch. And we went back to his office and Warren said, think about this for a few days and give me a call. And Paul said, I have been thinking about it during lunch and I will take the deal. And uh, at that time, TTI sales were in excess of a billion dollars. When Paul died, they were around six billion dollars. Uh, it really grew the company. As a postscript, Warren told me after Paul died, he said most of the managers were always trying to impress him and improve their pay. Paul never tried to impress and discourage pay. In 1990, on a beach in Florida, Baird Friedman asked me to chair the TCU board. I was honored to work with three chancellors, Bill Tucker, who's alive, <laughs> Ike uh, Ferrari, and Victor Boschini. They increased endowment by two billion, doubled the number of students, transformed the campus, and became a national university. Now I'll talk about some people that are alive. The Executive Roundtable has an executive committee, Pete Guerin, John Robinson, Bill Thornton, Wes Turner, Ken Barr, D. Kelly, and Mike Berry. I notified the committee that after 20 plus years, Van Blaylock and I will no longer be responsible for this organization. And the Executive Committee have selected D. Kelly and Mike Berry to be your leaders. Old frogs never die. <laughs> they just quit croaking. <laughs>